briefly to this uh, corporate committee meeting, the first of the missile year. Uh, I'm the governance officer for this meeting. Uh, normally we do start with the chair, but the first item is just for noting item one. Uh, if the committee members present, please could note the appointment of the chair and vice chair for the municipal year 23-24 members, please. Uh, sorry, sorry, we stickler. Could I ask them every turn the microphones on? Sorry, just so we got it in the recording. Noted. Uh, yeah. Noted. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, I think we'll just go to the next agenda item, which is the terms of reference. Thank you very much, and um, very nice to be here. <laughs> um, can I welcome everybody to the meeting? first of all, and um, in particular, I'd like to welcome the new members of Corporate Committee, who are Councillor Etty, and um, Councillor Goldberg, and Councillor Susurunga, and myself. <laughs> um, I just need to advise everybody, that this is a public meeting which is being live streamed for public viewing, and a record of the decisions published uh, will be published following the meeting tomorrow. Um, I'd like to welcome any members of the press and the public who might be viewing on, on the live stream. And if I can just remind all committee members um, are required to attend in person. Um, for those councillors who are accessing the meeting remotely, as a reminder that you won't be counted as being present for the purposes of the Local Government Act 1972. Um, and you may not vote in any item which comes up for a vote. Um, you may, however, at my discretion, uh, contribute to the discussion and participate in non-decision-making capacities. Uh, I'd also like to welcome any officers who've joined the meeting in the room, Jerry McCarthy, and also remotely. Um, I believe that Councillor Susan Fajana thomas is also going to join us in her capacity as Cabinet Member for Community Safety and Regulatory Services, because those issues will be under discussion this evening. So, um, if we can now move on then to the agenda item number two, which is the terms of reference of the corporate committee. Um, we, funnily enough, since I was uh, given this job as chairing the corporate committee, lots of people have asked me, uh, what does corporate committee actually do then? <laughs> <laughs> and I think actually, as we look at the terms of reference on page nine, perhaps the giveaway is on uh, point one, where it says to discharge all non-executive functions not allocated to the council or another committee, which basically means we pick up the bits that nobody else is doing. <laughs> um, now, there are several bits that we do pick up which are listed in, in some detail there as well, but I did just want to um, mention that Councillor Potter, who was previously chair of this committee, has liaised with the Chief Executive's Office to confirm that Corporate Committee will in this municipal year be overseeing the strategic policy. Uh, which is essentially how the council's manifesto commitments are built into the council's work plan um, and ultimate, ultimately how they become part of the corporate plan. It's a substantial amount of work and it will be overseen by Sonia Khan, who is the officer, in, who's the head of policy and strategic delivery. Um, perhaps actually, if you can bear with me, I can give you a sense of the sort of work that she's doing, um, if I can find it. Uh -huh. Yes, um, uh, Sonia says, um, work is being progressed to align delivery of the strategic plan to manifesto commitments, service delivery plans, resourcing, financial planning, performance management, and risk management. We're on, embarking on a piece of work over the summer to develop theories of change linked to the long-term outcomes in the strategic plan so we can support the whole organization. That's clearly a very big piece of work. Um, and I think it's likely, although it hasn't yet been confirmed, that Corporate Committee will have two separate reports over the coming year about the strategic plan. Um, so that we can take them perhaps first for an overview of how far they've got and some initial feedback, and then later on for, for a, a proper look at how that has become the, is to become the corporate plan. Um, the other thing I would just mention is that Hackney Council is due for a peer review 
of its services and operations. And um, that peer review is uh, again going to be overseen by us at the corporate committee. Um, but as the peer review isn't expected to take place until 2024, um, we will schedule work associated with that a bit later on down the line. So at this point, if I could just ask everybody to note the terms of reference. Thank you Noted. very much. Noted. Chair, could I just interject for a second? I think I've referenced it in the actual cover sheet. Um, obviously, there are a sort of review of the Constitution going on at the moment. So the terms of reference may indeed come back at some future date. I know there is a new format underway. So hopefully when that comes back or any other changes, obviously it'll come back to this committee. So these terms of reference are currently in the old format and they yeah, may be the current format, yes. Okay, thank you. Just to be clear, good. Um, so I think then we can move on to agenda item three, which is the establishment and composition of the planning subcommittee for the forthcoming, um, well, the current municipal year. Um, yes, the corporate committee has to approve the membership of the planning committee and we also have to note any further changes to the membership of the planning committee during the year. Um, so before, I mean in a nutshell what that means is that any, before anybody can sit on the planning committee they need to be approved by us. Um, it's also the case that anybody who sits on the planning committee has to have completed the relevant training. Um, there is one new member who has moved up from being a sort of substitute member to a full member of the planning committee, which is uh, Councillor Samatar. And, and I just wanted to double check that you have com completed that training. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. And if I could just use this as a moment to remind any of those substitute members that they do also need to complete that training if they ever want to step up and become a substitute. They wouldn't be allowed to sit on the planning committee if they haven't done that training. Good. Um, so can we, in that case, um, approve the establishment of the planning subcommittee, please? Approved. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, at this stage, then, uh, we now move on to item four, which is apologies for absence. Um, I have received apologies from Councillor Desmond, Councillor Narcross, Councillor Race, and Councillor Sadak. Um, I have no apologies for lateness, um, and everybody else looks like they're here, other than those who are attending online. Um, so they are Councillors Primru and Potter. So welcome to them. Chair, I'm not aware of any other apologies given for this meeting. To Thank clarify. you. Clarify. In that case, if I could please ask um, any councillors who have a declaration of interest which they would like to make to declare it now. Um, no, no one has a declaration of interest. Good. In that case, we can move on then to the minutes of the previous meeting um, on item six. I wasn't here for that meeting, so um, I'm not really in a position to approve or not. Um, Councillor Benny Lubbock? Uh, just one thing, a uh, factual thing, and a couple of sort of oh, questions. Um, I believe Councillor Maxwell was actually in attendance uh, in the, meet, the last meeting, so should be logged as such. And then just some of those matters arising, so things around, uh, I think we were to, due to get a report on the green flag work and the chief executive pay report, and I, I'm not sure if we've had all of that. Um, and as well as data on Dalston enforcement and equalities, demographic data, um, as well as uh, 6.1, it says that we would have a, a view of a policy on tables and chairs on pavements for this meeting, I believe. Um, I think it said June 2023. Um, and I'm wondering if we can also add in um, higher bikes on pavements. I can say that the report on the tables and chairs has um, been shifted to the meeting in September. So we are expecting that, but not until September. Um, with regard to the other things, um, I think I'll probably just have to ask Gareth, our officer, if he can chase those up. Um, yes, obviously. obviously it's now as a public record, so I've made a note and it'll be on. And obviously I'll check the relevant officers as well for providing an update either at the September meeting or I presume preferably before. And I think Jerry McCarthy would like to say something. Um, the enforcement and Dalston is in the enforcement report and this is this, the last report. Also, Councillor, you asked about temporary event notices of breakdown of by type. I have checked out at the moment we're not able to 
provide a breakdown by or it's a restaurant, a pub, a hall, whatever, to get contemporary event notices. When we have the new database, we should be able to provide that information. And there was one other question, Councillor Euro. I, I think that covered it apart from the yeah, those matters arising that I think we No, you are, yes, I remember what it was that has to do with um breakdown of people referred to turning point. We have asked turning point for that data, but there's a GDPR issue with information being provided, but our street population coordinator is following it up for me. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um Chair, just say that um Councillor Potter has raised her hand. Oh sorry, Councillor Potter. <laughs> um, Councillor Potter, what would you like to say? Um, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I mean, I'm very happy to come in after pe members, you know, that are legitimately in the meeting. I mean, I was just going to point out a couple of minor things. So on page five, you referred to Manor Park in terms of ASB, the minutes do, sorry. And I'm presuming that means Manor House rather than Manor Park, if I'm correct in that. Um, and just at the end, in terms of the actions, at the end of the last meeting, I got consent from um, members both um, to um, invite some of the members to the site site visit to um, Hackney Service Centre that the CJC um, ran um, recently, which I know we're going to talk about in a bit, and also what you referred to in terms of the work that that um, I was doing around the strategic plan. I got the members to agree to that. It's just not mentioned at all in the minutes. So I think it's important because it was uh, agreed by members that corporate committee should take that approach. Thank you very much, Councillor Potter. Um, yeah, I can certainly amend the minutes accordingly and obviously uh, a site visit i understand took place last month yes yeah on the 10th of may apparently i've been told so um sorry councillor Cicerunga. sorry chair i could stand up then you you might see me i apologize i don't want to make any comment on the substantive matter of the minutes because obviously i wasn't there but i did want to say that very much appreciate the fact that where in these long minutes where it actually stylistically says action point and in bullet uh, you know the bullet point action point in in uh, bold and then a designated person for action um i find that really helpful in respect of the minutes so i just wanted to um mention that it's very very helpful going forward thank you thank you very much um i don't know if that's hackney house style but perhaps we can adopt it um, corporate committee well, house i'm style. willing to look into that and, and amend the minutes accordingly if it's helpful for members i think it's a it's a tick isn't it for how they've done at the moment so if we can just carry on doing okay. like this that's good right. thank you very much good okay in that case sorry sorry chair i, sorry, chair, I think i've raised a head there i was going to say whether you'd agreed them or not but i think i've Got ahead of you there. Apologies. <laughs> no, I was just going to say. Well, we we can we agree the amin the minutes as they are to be amended. Then in that case, thank you. Agreed. Good. Um, so in that case, we'll move on to agenda item seven, which is future workplace and ways of working update. And we have uh, Rob Miller who is going to talk us through that, and he's online. So welcome, Rob. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to assume that members have had the opportunity to read the report, so I, I wouldn't go through that in detail. Would it be helpful if I just gave a very quick overview, or would you like to move straight into questions and conversation? I think a quick overview would be useful, yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's um, fine. So, um, in the report, we've basically set out our overall um, visions around our ways of working. Um, obviously, the lockdowns across the COVID pandemic period led to very sudden and um, significant changes for how people work. Um, probably the most important point to highlight, and in particular for Hackney Council because of our um, proudly held insourcing policy, we have a very significant number of members of staff who working from home wasn't something that they could do um, in, in carrying out their work and for whom um, coming to work carried on um, much as it had before, although often having to work in very different ways and under very different pressures. So teams in our parks, our, our waste and our street scene teams, um, seeing Jerry on the line, colleagues in the enforcement teams, 
they were out in their normal place of work across the borough um, and also having to work within the context of all of the challenges around the different COVID rules and often enforcing um, those in our public spaces. So um, whenever we've talked about our future workplace um, and our ways of working, it's been really important to highlight those colleagues because it's a significant percentage of our staff. Um, and when we talk about things like offices and the like, it can often sound like we're, we're not addressing their needs. So what we've tried to do throughout the work is make sure that we're covering not just people who work in offices and for whom um, home-based home working became all of their working life and then has remained a significant part of their work, um, but also colleagues in those other areas. In terms of how we're developing our future ways of working, we set um, our summarising section two of the, the college of the two left is leading around the right, the right for you work. And oh, can I, can I just really interrupt you for a moment? Um, I just need to check whether or not people can actually understand what you're saying, because I'm struggling. <laughs> um, I think it is a bit of a struggle to, to understand what you're saying. Um, I don't know if there's any way that you might be able to sit a bit nearer to your microphone or something like that. Or perhaps slow down a wee bit. Is that better? That is better, yeah. Um, Apologies, I think that's my headphones playing up, so I'll try and talk to you without that. Um, so, um, what we've tried to do is set out a vision for work where we, we're clear about the flexibilities that come possible with um, different ways of working. Um, that's important not just for staff and our ability to attract and retain staff, um, it also enables us to move further with our pre existing accommodation strategy around rationalising our office space. To make sure that we're using office space well, providing a welcoming environment, but also using that space efficiently. Um, in the report, we set out the principles, which we summarised there. It's very much resident-led, so the guiding, uh, you know, the guiding um, star around all of this is to make sure that our people are where they need to be to deliver the services our residents need. And um, we're reflecting that our services operate in very different ways, so there isn't a single corporate rule. For all of the fear, all of the different types of work, and um, those are being led at a service level. And um, so, for example, if you look at housing officers and tenancy officers, a lot of their work is actually out in our estates, visiting our tenants and leaseholders. And um, whereas other staff have worked from home for a large proportion of their time, um, for well, well beyond, you know, well before the pandemic. So we we haven't tried to have a single rule for the whole organisation. In section three, we summarise some of the work we're doing around off-campus workspaces. So there are larger offices, such as the Millfield Depot and the DLO, and smaller offices in, across our parks and green spaces. Um, in those, we're, we've been working to make sure they've got the kits and connectivity they need. Some of that links to the Better Broadband Programme, which is a separate piece of work that's bringing new broadband providers into the borough and allowing us to deliver better, better speed internet connections to those sites. So in some cases, we're hoping to significantly increase the um, you know, performance of the networks of those sites, but that depends on those new networks coming into the borough. So um, as soon as those are becoming available, and um, we're connecting to those. So for example, our parks offices in London Fields is currently in the process of being connected. In our campus workspace, we've rationalised that, so we've reduced the office buildings that we need to use. So we're consolidating into that town hall and the service centre. Sorry, please excuse the background noise. Um, we're equipping more of our rooms and video meeting facilities, which is meaning that um, we're sort of making hybrid working easier for people to do. Um, we've pi our pioneer service has been the Children's and Education Directorate, where we've been significantly increasing the collaborative space on that floor. Hackney Education colleagues have come into the Hackney Service Centre, which has brought those teams together so they can work together in a much more collaborative way. Um, and I've summarised in, in section four, you can see the, the graph there showing the increasing occupancy. So at the moment, um, over the last sort of six to nine months, we've seen a significant increase in the number of people in the Hickory Service Centre. Rob, um, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Um, I think we, we're still struggling to understand what you're saying. Um, I think it might be more productive, assuming that everybody's read the report, um, if we moved to questions. Um, and if I could apologise in advance if we're asking you questions about things we've already, you've already told us about but we didn't quite grasp. Um, I can see you're on the move um, trying to find a, a, perhaps a quieter spot or something like that. Um, we'll bear with you while you, <laughs> while you do that. I'm assuming you're not running away. <laughs> Thank you. 
Is that any better and less background noise? It is quieter, yeah. Would you like to carry on or shall we just move to questions? What do you Let, say? Let's move to questions if that's okay. Okay, right. In that case, I can see that Councillor Joseph has got a question. Councillor Young and Councillor Turbot Demo. So, so we'll take them in that order, please, for a start. Thank you very much, Chair. Hello, Rob. I um, hope you can hear me. Yeah, it looks like you can. Um, thanks for that. Um, on the very first page of the report, so page 19, um, there is a mention of releasing assets for alternative use, income generation. Um, I'm just wondering if we could get a bit more detail about how those decisions might be reached. And obviously that needs to be balanced with residents' need for face-to-face -face contact from certain services, um, particularly thinking about older people. Um, those who struggle with sort of digital communications. Um, and I think in terms of selling things off, we just need to be very careful that we, I mean, I would personally support a premise against sell off with a preference for sort of shorter term rentals that still bring in revenue, but don't lead to us losing quite valuable assets forever. Um, that's my first point. I'm very if I may. The other point is um, where you give the data for the service centre occupancy, do you have any data for pre-April 2020? Because I note that that was quite an unusual time. Um, in the, it, it was the beginning of lockdown. So would you have any data for pre-pandemic occupancy levels? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So on those two points, in terms of the uh, what happens with the assets, that, that's part of a separate asset review process, which um, the strategic property services team lead along with other council services and that that carefully considers and um, the different options with the building so i think you'll be familiar with um kelton house on mayor street which um used to be occupied by the finance um teams and was we moved into the hackney service center some years ago exactly as you're you're saying there councillor the um the building wasn't sold for a one-off capital gain um but has been leased out and is, is earning income for the council as well as helping reduce our revenue costs because we're then not um, responsible for things like security in the life of the building. So overall, that asset review process, which is which is separate. So the workplace changes effectively make space available for the asset pro review process to consider. And I wouldn't be the right person to talk about that in detail, but it, it looks very carefully at where that long term benefit for the council is. It's driven by um, you know, it's it's not a sort of just sale of assets. There are income generation opportunities, but also we look at other needs. So, for example, um, opportunities around temporary accommodation, which is desperately needed in the borough, is one of the other considerations when we're looking at um, those those assets. So, um, colleagues in other areas would be better placed to respond in detail of that. But hopefully, that gives you some some assurance that um, what we're not doing is just vacating buildings and selling them off. Um, there's a there's a carefully and thoughtful process, and it looks at that wider range of, um, of uh, things which are you know, best interest of the council and, and all our communities. In terms of face to face services, so the Hackney Service Centre um, face to face reopened. Gosh, is it early 2021? I think it's, it's some time ago, um, and and we've we've made those normal services available. We, some services have returned to exclusively face-to-face -face when actually we know that our residents would prefer some of those to still be accessible through other channels as well, not necessarily instead of. So for example, under the temporary COVID legislation, we were allowed to carry out some registrar's activity um, over, over the phone, such as registrations of deaths when people sadly pass away. Um, and we know that the, many residents appreciated that service. And I know that the governments are looking at um, future legislative change that might uh, enable those things to be services we can add in in future as well. Um, in terms of pre April 2020 occupancy, I'm afraid I don't have the data. Um, it was captured in a different way then and isn't, uh, it can't be used comparably. Um, but in terms of sort of rough numbers, the Hackney Service Centre was often not fully occupied. So uh, overall, if we're in the region of a peak of about 590, 600 people in the building at the moment, pre-pandemic, that would have been about 850, 900 um, in broad terms. Um, and again, it spreads differently through the week. So we're finding at the moment Tuesdays and Wednesdays are the, are the highest numbers um, and it tapers down at the other days. And that pattern would have been similar before. So, so in some cases, this is, um, I think if we had before the pandemic, 
you know, the tools that we use for remote meetings and the like we had for at least two years prior to that. Um, but if we had said to people, how much would be possible working remotely? Um, I think people would have found that quite extraordinary. And now, now it's it's routine. And this isn't just you know, the councillors and businesses and organisations around you know, across the country and around the world. For us, the key thing is to make sure we're using that as a as a benefit for staff, our residents, and the council. Um, but that we're not losing contact with the borough as well, which is why we're, we're taking that place and people based um, approach to how we design our ways of working. Thank you. Um, apologies to the question askers in the room. I'm just going to go to Councillor Potter first because um, one thing that Councillor Potter mentioned previously was that she'd led um, in her capacity as chair a, meet, a, a meeting of the corporate committee which visited the service centre and I had asked her if she would report back on, on uh, what members thought of the new arrangements and I forgot to do that so I'm sorry about that Councillor Potter maybe we could come to you now and if you've got a question on the end of it then do add it on. <laughs> You're, you're on mute at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So the visit on the 10th was actually led um, by Councillor Williams um, as part of a joint visit with the CJC, the Council Joint Committee, and also uh, members of the Corporate Committee. Um, it, it, we were shown round by the managers um, of all the various floors in the service centre. So from the corporate committee, we had Councillor Turbo Deloff and we had Councillor Young um, and we were limited to three people. So, but um, I think we managed to fit everybody in who can make it on that day. So we did see all of the kind of spaces being used. I mean, we felt we didn't, uh, we didn't want to disturb staff. So we didn't talk to staff at, you know, at length, but we had different staff members with us who, you know, kind of gave feedback on staff reaction to the changes. And from our perspective, from what I could see, it, you know, it seemed to be a very productive, positive, working dynamic on on the floors there. On the third floor, I think it is, Rob, um, it's kind of, you've got it to the level, that the way you've shaped it, the way that you want the whole of the building to be where you had different kind of flexible workspaces, which all seem to be used quite productively. So, I mean, my recommendation is, is that we perhaps do a follow on visits to some of the other um, off campus sites that Rob mentioned. I mean, obviously it's up to you chair to kind of decide when that might work and fit in, but I should certainly think it's important. And I think staff value um, of visiting their centres, so to go to the Millfield Depot, to go to Floorfield Street, um, I would certainly advise that course of action. But as Rob has set out, I think that is what we saw, and I don't know, Councillor Young and Councillor Turbo Deloff might have more comments to add on to that. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good idea, and I think it's something that we would like to take up. So thank you. Um, Councillor Young, you were next on the list. Um, yeah, sort of a bit of an observation from the visit and conversations had around the visit. And I've got a separate question, so two different things. And the first one was, um, I really enjoyed having the visit, so thank you for organising that. Um, and it was, I felt it was good to see people back in the offices. And one of the things that we saw was people looking at some very old maps, physical maps, um, and uh, from planning, I think, actually, which you couldn't have looked at in any other form. So the fact that they had the old books out, you know, something you'd really have to do in the office. Um, the one thing that concerned me and was mentioned, raised um, by another person on the visit, was around sort of equalities and inequalities and whether there is, whether there's any understanding of whether being back in in the office or you know either the need to be in the office or the um, feeling that there's a need to be in the office has poses any difficulties for some of our staff but not others so for example if I had to work in the customer services center it would pose no problems for me at all because I live five minutes away and I don't have any small children to collect from school but if I um, you know had been pushed out of Hackney by house prices um, and was living a long way away and did have children to collect, coming in 
might be a real problem for me. So I just wonder whether we have an understanding of um, what issues that poses for people and whether there's, um, you know, whether there are any mitigations that we can have around those. Because of course you can join a meeting online, but that's not the same as being there and having the face-to-face -face physical chat. So that was the first thing. I'm going to tell you the second thing now so you can answer them in whatever order. And um, the second question was, um, you said that the arrangements are very much resident-led and that's great. I uh, wondered about whether um, the new systems for neighbourhood office um, and neighbourhood staff um, on the ground is sort of, you know, how that's operating and how that's impacting on um, particularly those residents who were used to going into the neighbourhood office. I know we now have a kind of, I can't remember, an appointment or a drop-in system where um, housing officers are out and about, but can people still come into their local neighbourhood office and expect staff members to be there um, if that's what they need? Uh, Robert, I, I think... Probably we're looking at questions around equality's impact assessments and really to some extent, is that right? And and perhaps whether or not we're breaking those down by department as well. I think we, it says here that, that it's not, a, there's no need for an equality impact assessment right. for this report. So perhaps uh, why not? Shall I um, come in on that? I can hear you if, if you'd like to. <laughs> Can can you hear me? Okay, I'm trying the he headphones again. So if they um, if you get audio issues at my end, then please let me know. Can you hear me? Okay, at the moment. We can just about hear you. Talk slowly. <laughs> okay. Um. So to pick up on those questions, so um, specifically with regards to the neighbourhoods offices, um, I think the detail of how that service is being designed would be better answered by Steve Waddington and colleagues in housing services. At a high level, um, I know, um, and I've joined some of the staff live streams that Steve has done with his service, setting out how he's expecting housing services to work. Um, he's very conscious of the need to make sure that housing offices are, are visible and accessible to tenants and leaseholders. So, for example, they've arranged surgeries in the neighbourhood's offices so that people can come and see their housing officer. He's set out a clear expectation of um, housing officers doing a significant proportion of their time on a state. So not just in the office, because the HSC is obviously um, no more close to a resident than um, if you're working from home. So I know that Steve, has, that's very much on his mind and it's very much designed into his ways of working. But in terms of like the, the service to tenants and leaseholders, I do think Steve would be better placed to provide detailed information on that. In terms of the broader equalities impacts, so um, there's probably three strands to the answer. So so the specific reference to the report is this report itself doesn't require an equality um, impact but in terms of how we have designed the workplace arrangements equalities has been a very much core to that so we've done significant staff engagement not just to all staff but also we've done specific work with the different staff equalities groups so that we're making sure we're listening to their needs understanding their needs and reflecting them in our plans and um, we've also worked very closely to make sure we've got active dialogue with colleagues in the unions throughout the pandemic so that we're hearing from there, from them in terms of impacts on staff, anxieties around staff, opportunity staff would like us to pursue. So we've made sure that that sort of wide and deep engagement is, is in place throughout. Um, in terms of the specifics of individuals working arrangements, obviously individual circumstances can vary significantly. Um, We've tried to make sure, I mean, the council's flexible working policy, which predates the pandemic, provides a wide range of different tools which managers and staff can use to provide work, working flexibility to help people work around family commitments and the like. Um, we have to strike a balance. So we know that throughout the pandemic, you know, some residents were complaining if they could hear family in the background um, when they were talking to a council officer, for example. Now, obviously, at a time when schools were closed, there was very little that people and people were required to work from home. There's very little that people, especially people living without spare rooms and the like to work from were able to do. So um, again, throughout the pandemic, if people's home conditions just wouldn't work for them to work, we, we made sure that we had COVID secure workspace available in our offices for them. As more people come in the office, 
Um, we're asking managers to, to work with staff to have, have, a, have a balance around work life. Obviously, work and service for our residents has to come first, but the flexible working policy, like I said, provides a wide range of different ways that we can make that flexible to people's needs. Um, and then, um, you know, th there are different things which can either be just general flexibilities or more formal agreements, such as compressed hours, um, different flexible working hours, depending. My own experience with my teams has been that the flexible working policy, the breadth of it gives me most of the options we need to come up with a range of work well for people. But if you have very specific needs, for example, around disabilities or other accessibility needs then we would go through a more formal route to make sure that we've got the right arrangements in place so sorry a bit of a long answer hopefully that came across all right but i hope the act sort of helps with the clarity there thank you yes very much so um councillor turbot Delph. thank you chair um thank you Rob. I, I was one of the people that attended the site visit it was really really good I'm just confirming what councillor potter and councillor young has said my questions that related to health and indoor quality for workers. Um, what I noticed in the building is that there is a high number of PCs um, in, for workers. Um, I didn't see enough greens, even though the building has such beautiful amount of light coming through. Um, this is, the question is about what, if there has been some risk assessments, which I'm, I'm guessing they have, but they have been, but are there any other plans related to maybe indoor air pollution that might be happening, uh, being exposed to so many computers? Because I think it's quite heavily, it's a beautiful place, but I think it's quite heavily, um, um, yes, populated by a lot of computers. And then the second question, very briefly as well, is uh, about the disposal of such computers of uh, assets, that, uh, electrical assets that, that, they, that, you know, that, that we have. I was really glad to hear that there might be some program happening where circular economy kind of, you know, it takes place where we perhaps are donated, but it'd be good to hear how that happens. At the time, we didn't have enough time for those details, but it'd be good for the commission to hear. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. So in terms of the air quality, um, we, we've carried out quite extensive um, checks on the ventilation to make sure that the air through put fresh air into the building um is is adequate um at that, and we've done that as part of the arrangements to return to normal building occupancy after the easing of lockdown restrictions so um in many ways the the kind of coverage in the media was that the lockdown's over restrictions are finished but actually there's still quite a lot of guidance which is either pre-existing or post-covid um guidance in terms of air quality and, and, and the sort of air throughput that's needed so we we've, we've checked that quite carefully um, to make sure that we've got yeah, the ventilation systems working adequately and that we're, we're advising um, staff about occupancy levels. So, for example, some of our meeting rooms, we held them back at a lower occupancy while those checks were taking place until we were assured that the air throughput was appropriate for, for normal normal use again. So, um, I hope that gives you the, the confidence in the, in the ventilation. And the, and the buildings are different. The Hackney Service Centre is a more modern building and has a, a kind of a modern heating ventilation system. The town hall, uh, a heritage building doesn't. Um, so then you know, relies on making sure that windows are open, for example, when meetings are being held and the like. Um, in terms of the circular economy, so we did a big refresh of our computing equipment a few years ago. It was taking place the year before um, the pandemic. Um, what we did immediately when the pandemic happened was we actually repurposed a lot of those computers, which we had very recently refreshed and still had in store to support people who suddenly had to work from home if they didn't have their own equipment. Um, and then we've been working with um, colleagues in Hackney Education um, throughout the pandemic with the donation process um, to, to get computing equipment to schools. I don't have the numbers to hand, but uh, um, I could follow up offline if that would be helpful. But a large number of devices um, went to children in Hackney schools, partly from the DfE's own scheme, partly through the council, and also through donations through the local community. Um, some of those were cash donations, but some of it was, was recycled equipment. And we worked with Hackney Fixers, who did um, some of that work to get those devices um, ready to, to be shared with um, Hackney students. 
Thank you. Um, I guess the only comment I'd make on that personally is, is to think about those students who need to access computers outside of school time as well and to sort of try to think about homework clubs and stuff like that as well as just schools when, when thinking about sort of redistribution. Um, Councillor well, Ette. The devices were, sorry, Councillor Ratt, the, the devices were issued to the to the children. So so depending on the arrangements they have with the schools, they, they could do so. We also, um, part of the DFD scheme, had um, 4G mobile connections for children who didn't have internet at home. Um, and as part of our better broadband scheme, what we've done with that is the providers are coming into the borough, uh, providing a range of social value um, Kind of contributions to the borough which includes things like free connections into some of our hostels into community centers and discount vouchers um for tenants on our estates um uh, if, if they need help um with the cost of a broadband thank you for that clarification um councillor Ate, i think wanted to say something and councillor samatar afterwards thank you chair thank you rob for the um, detailed update and um for all the answers i think you've um, indirectly said something about what i wanted to ask and which is about the mobile phones because you've talked about transition to a new sim provider i wanted to know has the transition has that been done or when will that be when will that take place in terms of um, to the new provider sim provider thanks uh thanks guys i see that that, um, that work completed and, and I think it's 2024 the contract runs to, but we, we, we keep those on a fairly short contract. That when we change, there's a fairly significant effort of swapping out one provider's SIM cards with a new provider's SIM cards. Um, however, we, we it's a market that moves quite quickly, so we don't sort of enter into long like 10-year contracts so that we can make sure we're taking advantage of price changes. Councillor Samatar. Thank you, Chair. Um, Rob, can you hear me? I'm just trying to like lean forward some more. Um, I've got a bit of a cheeky question for you because I've got, I see the greenery behind you and I'm a bit envious. And as I was looking through the pictures here on the report, um, and I'm sure in colour it will be a lot more better as well about um, one of the priorities at the beginning is to sp speaks about staff well-being and um, mental health generally as you a lot of people have been in lockdown for so long working from their homes and even some people had the you know opportunity to go outside and work in like comfortable places so from what I can see here it looks like straight back to like corporate like kind of environment so how what does that look like a bit more on what the staff well-being and and in terms of not just the actual mental health support but the creating that comfortable place for staff i just wanted to have a bit of vision on that yeah it's, it's a really important point actually i think the um the lockdown has affected many people yeah in, in really varied ways one of the conversations that we were having during the um, pandemic were the different stresses that staff face depending on their work. So, you know, colleagues in Jerry's enforcement teams, for example, were under a huge pressure making sure that our parks and green spaces were, were being used appropriately and managing you know, huge demand on those spaces. Um, but actually, there are many people who, for whom working from home was also really stressful and difficult, especially people who live on their own. Um, and didn't have proximity with others um, who they shared the home with. So the, the well-being needs have been really broad. Um, we've approached that in a range of ways. Um, so thinking about you know, green space, for example, we're, we're really fortunate with the amount of green space that we have in Hackney. So Ian Holland and the um, Parks and Pleasures and Green Spaces Service has been actively promoting opportunities to use green space, you know, our, our green spaces for, for meetings, especially when we're in nice months like this. Um, and some of our buildings, um, you know, where, for example, my, one of my teams, we had a, a strategy morning at the beginning of the week, um, and we held that at Springfield House, um, which was made available to us, which again was you know, really positive in terms of a change of scene, and, and again, celebrating uh, Springfield Park and, and Hackney's green spaces. In terms of the office environment itself, we have, we have changed it quite significantly. Um, prior to the pandemic, it was very much rows of chairs and desks. Um, that's opened up significantly and like councillor potter said with the third floor of the Hackney service center which has been our, our pioneer if you like working with jackie burke and the um children's education service 
we've made huge progress reducing a lot of sort of cupboard space and paper files which have been removed um we've opened up uh, space to take away barriers we've put in more flexible furniture and more space for people to come together and collaborate differently when in the workspace because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't simply trading a desk at home for a desk in the office we actually wanted to encourage people to get the benefits of working with their colleagues my reference earlier to increasing the amount of video meeting kit is making sure that um, there aren't barriers to that simply if you can't get everybody together so that people can still join in there are some challenges with hybrid meetings if you're the one person who's on a video screen and everyone's there in person there is your meeting etiquette which needs to be thought about quite carefully to make sure that meeting remains inclusive um but yeah to give you um, some reassurance you know with there, there's been a significant amount of work on well-being um and and that remains a, a key area of focus and that, and i know Sandra Farkas and our new director of hr and od is working to develop our um od and strategy moving forward and well-being will be part of that i'm sure Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I can't see any more hands up, but I, I do have a question which may possibly have... Sorry, Chair, uh, Councillor Premier. Oh, sorry. I did have a hand up for quite a long time, sorry. That's true, you did. Councillor Premier, I'm sorry. Are you, are you there? Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you for letting me ask a question. Apologies that I can't be there in person tonight. I missed a tiny bit of the questions um, because my sound went off, um, but I think I heard most of it, most of the answers. And thanks very much, Rob, for explaining about the um, equalities in you know, investigation and also about the ventilation, which is what I wanted to come back to. Um, during the pandemic, um, and uh, and still, um, the government slightly led us astray, to say the least, with the concentration on the safety measures being distancing and hand washing, and we know that it is all about ventilation because of airborne disease. Um, we also know that whatever the, the, the line is, that COVID is, has not yet gone. Um, we know people who are sick and people who are suffering. Um, and also with environmental degradation, we will sadly have more zoonotic diseases um, and just I suppose as a matter of good form too, um, we all know that we share illnesses in workplaces. So if making them safe for just like keeping everybody um, as well as possible. Um, my question about ventilation was the carbon monitoring. Um, and I think the union on um, the joint union strategy on um, seeing if we can get to a level of, of 800 parts um, per million of carbon, which is really, really a sort of very good exchange for trying to make sure that viruses can't spread. Um, and whether there is a policy on this and how that relates to council buildings. Thanks very much. I'm going to be slightly out of my depth on the technical detail. Um, we one of the things which frustrated some of my colleagues across the council was that we didn't return our meeting rooms as i mentioned earlier to normal use more quickly um and that that was exactly because we wanted to make sure that those air that the ventilation checks took place to give us assurance in terms of the specific levels that you're describing there i'm afraid i don't have the answer to hand um but i'm happy if, if gareth if you wouldn't mind recording that as an action i'm happy to follow that up and then come back offline um and provide the committee with that information Thank you. That was it. Thank you. Um, just quickly then, my, my quick final question, I think, is, is about better broadband. In your report, you, says it, you said it will be in place by spring. Is it in place um, across the whole workplace? Um, and how's it going? And, and indeed, how are you monitoring it? Yeah, so, so the, the, um, if you go to Hackney WK, I think it's Hackney WK slash broadband, it, it talks about the better broadband program. Um, so it has a it does have a direct reference to our workplaces but it's it's a much broader program than that so it was a, a piece of work um really designed um it linked to a manifesto commitment to um administration you know, the previous administration about bringing you know, opening up the market in hackney which previously had very much been bt and virgin media as the only providers and we we got regular and pension residents who felt that the market wasn't serving them and they were struggling to find decent connections so um one of the things which um the way we responded to that is we brought together what's called a way leave where basically we do a piece of work once to make the regulatory barriers to new providers coming into the borough easier by effectively having a single document and commitment that they can sign up to which enables a number of things which they would otherwise have to ask the council for in more complicated ways 
to be done much more uh, in a much more streamlined way. And what we've done as part of that is, as I mentioned earlier, the quid pro quo is we're asking provide. We've made it agnostic to providers because we want to encourage as many providers in as possible. Um, but what we've done with that is we've um, asked them to make sure that there are social value commitments, which is what I was referring to earlier. The benefit of that for the council and our workspaces is it means that uh, there are more areas of the borough, especially, as I said earlier, parts of the um, council workforce who aren't in our main big offices. It brings fibre connections to a wider part of the borough. So there are a number of offices where prior to the um, Better Broadband programme, people were getting by on extremely poor connections in the same way that some of the residents who used to complain to us um, uh, used to raise. Um, and that has all sorts of impacts in terms of people's ability to, to work, especially if you do more stuff on video. No, no, no. So the Better Broadband programme is ongoing. Um, we've had three providers sign up to the commitment and they are now rolling out connectivity across the borough. So it's their delivery programmes which they're managing and delivering. But as those roll out and they're in progress, when those new fibre connections become available, yeah. those become available to residents, but also to us. So we've, we've been able to use those as they've rolled out to significantly increase connections to offices in those spaces. Um, and we've also significantly increased the speed of the council's internet connection again to make sure that um, staff in our offices get a decent um, internet connection. I, I hope that helps. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good. In that case, um, I think we've given you a good grilling on that. and. <laughs> Uh, I think we can note this report. Thank you very much. And um, you can go and enjoy the rest of the sunshine. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, good. OK. Um, thanks, everybody, for that very good, important discussion, actually, on the nature of the workplace. Um, Agenda item eight now is Jerry McCarthy, who is going to introduce this item on business regulation service delivery plans. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll do a brief summary of the report and then I'm happy to take any questions members have after that. Um, this report relates to service delivery plans for the current financial year for the business regulation teams within the community safety enforcement of business regulations and uh, Within business regulation, you've got environmental health, food safety, health, occupational health and safety, environmental protection, trading standards and licensing. This report just relates to environmental health and trading standards. Um, the food law enforcement service plan, which I'll use FLESS because it's much easier to pronounce, is a statutory plan which sets out how the council will undertake enforcement of food safety legislation. It's prepared in accordance with Food Standards Agency's Framework Agreement. It sets out the objectives of the service and demonstrates how they are linked to the Mayor's priorities and sustainable community strategy. The performance of the plan is measured against the fulfillment of the plan, the percentage of broadly compliant premises within the borough. Broadly compliant premises are those which have a food high above. And obviously the Food Standards Agency continue to monitor how we the service, we have to do an annual return, which to the local authority enforcement monitoring system back to the food agency annually. In terms of health and safety, enforcement is split between the HSC, health and safety executive, and the council dependent on the activity being undertaken. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. So construction activities would be dealt with by the HSC and a restaurant, health and safety restaurant would be dealt with by the council. And obviously, Hackney is an enforcing authority in its own right and has officers have powers to undertake health and safety, visit inspections and enforcement, including service improvement and prohibition notices. And obviously, the health and safety delivery plan fulfills the council's obligations under Section 8 of the Health and Safety Work Act 1974, which is totally different from, from the internal health and safety officers employed by the council. Again, the HSE collects data annually on that. In terms of trading standards, again, it's the same objectives that are of the service, and the service provides support to individual communities and businesses in the borough, and obviously helps people buy goods and services with confidence and security, and offering advice 
the businesses to help them comply with the law. Um, on paragraph 4.1, just the, the food safety that I said is in a, done in accordance with the Food Standards Agency requirements. And obviously, paragraph 4.3, this 2077 Food Hygiene Food Standard Intervention due. This is based on the premises risk rating and the number of new registrations. And obviously, the service has prioritised the highest race risk category of premises, which are category A and B. So we, the intention is to inspect 100% of them within 28 days of the due date. And obviously, we will do 95% of service requests, consumer complaints, with other complaints to be dealt within 10 working days. And paragraph 4.5 shows there was a deficit of 2.3 full time equivalent officers in the last financial year. And then I just want to refer to paragraph 4.6, where the Food Standards Agency had obtained government permission to deviate from this, but that finished at the end of March 2023. And then paragraph 4, we had 800 businesses due for inspection last year. We actually undertook officers undertook. 958 inspections, and that's due to concentrating on clearing the backlog of unrated premises. And an unrated premises is a business which has applied for registration, but hasn't actually operated. So we get quite a lot of registrations of business which never operate. So people might apply to, I don't know, make jam for a fair or a market or something, but they may never operate, it's just speculative. And if there is an issue with the non-rated premises, what we will just say, for this example, a takeaway that needs to go on the delivery platform, such as Deliveroo or Just Eat or whatever, we will endeavour to inspect those quickly so they can actually get a rating of three or above if they meet that standard. So then they can be accepted by the delivery platform. And obviously we're cognizant of the fact that in Hackney, a lot of businesses are small, ME, small SMEs, so a small SME doesn't have the resources that a national chain would have. So we actually try to give them support to actually get that rating of three or above. It's really important we do that due to a number of small businesses. And obviously COVID has had a huge impact on small businesses, a lot of them have closed. Whereas there's different, as I said, national chain, they have the resources, they've got credit to enable them to stay open and diversify, whereas a small business doesn't actually have that luxury. And they're just trying to keep going, comply with the law, and we do what we can to support those as well. Um, paragraph 4.8, this relates to overdue category. We've reduced that from 833 down to 504. You might ask what a category E business is. That's a business, something like a small, a, a chemist would be one. And you would ask, why would you inspect a chemist to sell baby food? So it's just something as simple as that, or it could be a small shop that doesn't actually sell any hot food or anything like that. It might sell refrigerators or something, as long as spread all the other normal essentials. So that is, they actually are a low rate of premises. I just must have highlighted as well paragraph 4.9, which showed at the end of the financial year, our number of businesses that have a food hygiene rating of five, which is the highest rating, has gone up from 52 to 56%. And we don't actually have any premises which are rated zero, which is actually very good news. And there is a breakdown of the different ranges at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. And obviously it's important that we have as many businesses which are rated three or above, which again helps people to get on delivery platform if they're actually operating a takeaway service. Obviously, and the other thing is that paragraph 4.11, last year showed the service would receive 600 new registrations but we actually got 831 and 334 of those were inspectors and we get an average of about 69 a month. So it's continuing, it's not decreasing, it's increasing. And obviously one of the reasons for that is due to conflicting advice issued by the government regarding the difference during COVID of essential and non-essential businesses permitted to remain open. So for example, during COVID, when most shops say we're closed, say a closed shop could apply to be a food business and sell bread and milk and then they could sell clothes as well. So it's, it is, it's not straightforward, but it's a way of getting around any restrictions. The other thing I did want to point out to you in terms of food safety is that we stand to say a review of how food safety is delivered. That's outlined in paragraph 4.15.
in the main, what they want us, or the local authorities to do is concentrate on higher risk premises. And obviously, lower risk premises would get less inspection regime. So it could technically be inspected every five to 10 years, which doesn't seem very good because the lower risk premises, depending on what they're doing, could cause problems as well. So there is a consultation out in that at the moment, which is due to for to reply to by the end of June. If there isn't a London-wide response to the Association of London Environmental Health Managers acting with a specific response to the consultation, and we'll give our views on what the Food Standards Agency is proposing. But I just want to make members aware of that, that there are significant changes planned from April 2025 onwards, and it would fundamentally change how we deliver our food safe service. And again, that places as high risks to residents, and ultimately, our main goal is to protect the public. Um, in terms of health and safety, officers use enforcement powers open to them, and that's detailed at paragraphs 4.20 onwards. And I have to say, for this year, we don't have we, we don't actually have any high risk inspections due. All we they're all set out in a circular from the health and safety executive. What we will do, though, if officers say are out doing a food hygiene inspection in a restaurant and they see an imminent health and safety risk, they will take action to deal with that health and safety risk through service of improvement or prohibition notice, depending on what's happening. And obviously, we also receive accident notifications. And last year, we received 112. And we, we have dealt with those appropriately. Um, paragraph 4.23 on was details our trading standard service. And that's an excellent performing service. Again, the details of the inspections due and what was due are covered in the table at the bottom, paragraph 4.26. It's on page 35. I don't know what that helps you or not. And we obviously have undertaken equality impact assessment in conjunction with this report. It's there for you to read. And obviously, we have done a risk assessment on that as well. And that's in paragraph 4.33. And that's about it from me, but I'm happy to take any questions members may have. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to kick off actually by um, thanking the staff working in food safety, because I think one of the things that these figures show is how hard they've had to work during the pandemic. I think it's really, you know, there are obviously some workers who had to work very hard during the pandemic, but there are, it impacted lots of other people too. And perhaps um, the people in food safety have been overlooked and it takes the publication of figures like this to show just how much extra work they had to put in. So if you could please pass our thanks on to that. And also um, some congratulations, I think, for boosting the number of five-star hygiene ratings that we have now in Hackney, which is great. Um, just one other observation really is, is about the risk matrix, which, which um, does appear to show that we do need extra resources in order to meet the growing need that you talked about. I just wonder what we've got in place to, to deal with that. So we, we are expecting an additional 800 registrations this year, as well as the inspections that are due. But what we have done is we've taken on an additional agency member of staff, and we are lucky to take on an other additional agency, member agency of staff that's out to advert at the moment. And what we will do is we will review this quarterly, so we'll just be reviewed at the end of June and again at the end of September. And if it's showing that we need additional resources, then I will make a bid to our group director for additional staff in this area, be it a cabinet member who is actually very supportive of this work. Any other questions from other members? Councillor Binny Lubbock. Hi, thank you very much for this report. Um, uh, I was just going to ask around uh, on page 65 of, uh, of our book, 4.3.3 on in the, in the report, um, it says that there'll be uh, improved information. I'm just wondering uh, about how many complaints the, top, the public actually make around food safety issues, so, you know, food poisoning and things like that. And how would they know that they should make a complaint to the council if they, if they get food poisoning or does the establishment have to sort of self-report um, and if there's better signposting through the website etc won't that increase the workload um, if more people are, are knowing how to do that that reporting 
We already get notifications of through UK FSHA, which involves public health dignity. So if somebody has confirmed as having a foodborne illness, that would be passed to us. So it was well, regardless of what it is, whether it's salmonella, E. coli or whatever, with toy for whatever, which may not become from a restaurant. So I think it's food rate, we will look at those. We also investigate suspected food poisoning in as well. Yes, it would increase the work though, but we have I should have put into the report how many uh, service requests we receive for in relation to food complaints by members of the public and how many um, infectious disease notifications we dealt with or how many. So what I can do is provide that information to Gareth and then that will be available for you too. Councillor Arthur. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you, Jerry. Let me echo the Chair's what the Chair in terms of um, a congratulatory message and a big thank you to the team that within Hackney, there is no business that has a zero rating. I think that is highly commendable. And that wouldn't have been achieved without um, the hard work of you and the team. And I think these are some of the informations that we really have to let the public and the community know. So it shows the extent and also the confidence with regards to people eating out and the level of work that has been done um, and ensuring that they are eating well in various eatery um, places. I just, I, my question is on page 70 because you've talked on increasing the rate of inspection from 170, 170 pounds to 320 pounds in 2023, 24. And I'm just thinking if I am a business owner and the rates, this has been increased to this, what other additional benefits are we putting in place for those businesses? So even before the re-inspection, what are those supports that are in place? So it's not just about having the inspection and I'm having to pay for this, but at the same time, knowing fully well and be confident that there are other additional in, um, supports that are being put in place from us as the council. And one of the things I was looking at, I mean, I was thinking is, do we have, maybe prior to the reinspection, do we have anything on the on our website that the businesses will have to go through, you know, more or less like pre-check for them within themselves, you know, before you actually come in to do the pre-inspection or anything or of such. So, I mean, I just wanted to know a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you. We would, the reason people pay for re-inspection would be because they would they would a re-inspection without three months passing, and that's to increase the, the, the inspection back so you could pay. So if whatever needs to be done could be done within two weeks, you could apply for the re-inspection, and then that would increase your rating. And businesses do that, for example, for delivery platform purposes to get that rating. But we, we provide advice to businesses. We provide them with safer food, better business information when we're doing inspections. That is provided to businesses. And if a business comes back to us, mainly what they will want is they will need, they, the reason they will probably get a low rating is because they want to again have a food safety management system in place. And again, as I said earlier on, and small SME is is less likely to have that than a national chain. So why we try and support businesses if we can to get a better rating. So we provide assistance and guidance to businesses to do that. We can't provide, we can't write the food safety management system, but we point them in the direction of where they get all the information to enable them to do that. Can I ask a quick um, clarification question on that? Sure. I just, I'm not sure I understand what, when reinspection takes place, I know you've just half explained it, but just for anyone else in the same position as me, why would a reinspection occur? To give a business a better rating, normally it would happen automatically after three months of inspection. But if businesses can pay to have that inspection done sooner, 
which helps them. So if you've got a rating of two, you won't get on a delivery platform, Uber Eats or Deliveroo. That's why. Councillor Taylor Delloff. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted very briefly as well to reiterate how impressive the detail is and really reassuring as a Hackney resident to hear how much, how many inspections, uh, inspections take place. Um, I had a, a, a business that uh, reached out um, for support when they were going through their own inspection in Latin American uh, business. And they were very impressed with all the work, you know, the, 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 the support, but the language was an issue. So I was wondering, um, eventually they did get in, they were on business, uh, uh, run Hoxton, and was, they were very happy with that. But I'm just wondering in terms of support for those communities that don't have English as a main language going through the whole process of inspections and whether there is some support with that. Although I appreciate it might be difficult because suppose the, the guidance has to be in English. But just wondering on that. Thank you. We can provide them with a link to the information and language of the, that, that they want, for example. So that can be done. And I know that we've provided safer business information in alternative languages, not just English. So we may have that as a large pocket community to example in Vietnamese. Um, what is isn't in this report, because it's not necessarily relevant to one thing we've also done, we have a full-time officer who is dealing with health education commitment, to, which actually shows that the food people is healthy. Um, the numbers of that are actually increasing and we're getting a lot more inquiries about that, which is really good as well. And that's something we're doing in conjunction with the public health team, so that people are actually getting healthier food. And there are counting as a street in Hoxton where one business has got, got the health education commitment approval, and another four have now joined it because they've seen the sticker and they've seen what they want to get the business as well. And we actually encourage, we will go and sit with the businesses to actually do that and work with them so they can do that. And these are all small businesses as well. And obviously the officer doing that again will provide food hygiene training for those businesses as well. That, just very briefly, Chair, sorry, that actually was my follow-up uh, question and you just basically answered because the, a lot of um, the myth is that oh, because I don't speak English, you know, uh, I, I won't be able to kind of go forward or, or get through that process. And a lot of, you know, uh, global majority communities are very, you know, rich in sort of cuisine and that's one of the number one things that, that, that we kind of bring uh, and it's our trade. So that's really good to hear. Thank you, because that is sort of stops a barrier or barrier that people might think they exist, but it doesn't. So thank you very much. I do have to say, as a rule, we don't generally provide free food hygiene training for businesses. This is businesses who have applied for the health and catering commitment to help them obtain that because they're achieving a certain standard and we provide free food hygiene for those businesses. The problem with us providing food hygiene training for everyone is cost. We would compare it to other organisations. You can do an online course for £20 to do food hygiene training. We couldn't offer that course to any other £20. Pounds. Uh, Councillor Potter, online. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to follow up with the proposed changes to the food hygiene rating scheme. Um, and just in 4.17, you talk about the fundamental change, which you wanted to alert us to. And I know you, you referred to this previously. Um, can you just outline what you, because you talk about obviously the direct impact on human resources, the current compliance landscape. It's, can you give an idea of what you think might be the change in terms of the need for additional resources and whether you've, you know, you've had those conversations about, you know, additional, you know, resources with finance? We haven't had any discussions yet with finance. It won't be in place if it is in place until April 2025 at the earliest. But what does concern us is, for example, a business with a high risk, that is high risk, could be inspected every two months, which to me does not seem necessary or reasonable. And I don't think food businesses would want environmental health officers in every two months checking them anyway. So there is a lot to go. It's still out of consultation. The Food Standards Agency wants to do pilots with some authorities in the next financial year with a view to bring it 
National League the following year. So, but I say, if the consultation isn't responded to by London, we will do our own hackney response and get our viewpoint across on that. And obviously, one of the things they're looking at as well is, which you will see in the report, is having less qualified officers doing some inspections, which obviously does pose a risk and some questions as well. And our members are fully aware of this at the moment. Thank you. Can I just uh, add, add to that, really? Because one of the other things I saw in the report was that uh, they're looking at some virtual inspections. I don't think that happens at the moment. And are you, are you concerned about that? We don't do any virtual inspections. I would have concerns about that. I would be recommending that. Um, I just, um, I mean, you've, you're obviously not completely comfortable with, with the FSA proposals, but it is in a consultation phase at the moment. Um, I just wonder whether or not this committee is, should be saying anything as part of the consultation. And if you think that's appropriate, perhaps you can advise us. If we were to do it, we would do something on behalf of our cabinet member. That would be the most appropriate way for that to, do, to deal with that. But as I say, if there isn't a London-wide one, we will do our own. Okay, your concerns are noted, though, I think, and we, I think we probably share them. So, thank you. Um, Councillor Samatar. Thank you, Chair. Um, I um, wanted to ask a question about um, enforcement. And when we're, and also kind of linking it with the overall ratings for particular business, especially food um, delivery ones as well, how um, is the outside also taken into consideration, not just the inside? For example, there are quite a few places in my ward in Shacklewell where, and I have to give a huge, huge thank you to our street team um, that I raised so many back to back again and again inquiries on businesses dumping a large um, things outside and residents or passerbys would then send us pictures and saying this is outside this place etc so when it comes to enforcement if a particular business has more than one complaint of situations like that outside then what would be the protocol and have there been situations where enforcement have been followed in situations like that during food safety inspections there would all officers would check his desk they have a system, a method of disposal, the correct method of disposal. If, for example, it's a butcher shop, the byproducts of that have to be disposed of in a very specific manner. That can't go into the general waste, obviously because of BSE concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It has to be disposed properly. But if we would normally deal with that through our environmental enforcement team rather than food safety for businesses dumping waste. And just question back to you: Are these time banded streets, or are they not? Oh, um, I, I don't know if it's the only place that's gone through the, the situation, but it's been like the third or fourth time that that's place, particular place. Happy to talk to you. I just, it kind of made me think when I saw the enforcement and um, kind of like the safety and things. On. If you have any concerns about a, a business dumping waste, just email enforcement support at hackney.gov.uk and it will get picked up. And is that obtaining for public as well? Yes. Like, what would is there like uh, um, on there's, that question? information on our website. Yes. On, okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think if there are no more questions, then um, if I can ask everybody to agree, the food law enforcement service plan for 2023-24, please. Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. And now we can move on to item nine, which again is going to be introduced by Jerry, I think. Um, Thank you, Councillor. There isn't anyone else here to do it. <laughs> so this report sets our general report across the enforcement remit for the last financial year. And obviously the committee has requested reports on this in have going forward for a number of years. Obviously, it sets the areas related to enforcement, management arrangements, and resources that are available. Obviously, would say the enforcement and hackney continues to incorporate an integrated approach, including environmental enforcement, which looks at issues such as 
highway obstructions, a boards, littering, fly tipping. So the most appropriate action is taken. And officers undertake a wide range of enforcement investigations in relation to antisocial behaviour with partners, including Hackney Housing, the police, housing associations, and obviously we use all the powers available under the Antisocial Behaviour Crime Policing Act 2014, which includes closure orders and, and closure notices, community protection warnings, notices, injunctions, and antisocial behaviour warnings as appropriate. There is background information here which I'm not going to go into on page 124 to set out and what I will do it probably best explains you an organogram and I will get one put together which I could forward to Darth later which can be added to the minutes before the next meeting but what I did want to say is in terms of environmental enforcement we have a weekly tasking meeting we have a monthly partnership tasking meeting and obviously we have our intelligence help as well so the weekly tasking meeting looks at a whole range of issues and they're outlined 4.6. The monthly meeting looks at more ingrained issues and we meet with the police and other partners and obviously with CCTV as well as that. And so, so there's a multi markets attend both weekly tasking and partnership tasking. Officers and children from the youth attend partnership tasking as well as there's any issues associations with young people they can be looked at when all the partners are in the room and obviously that's outlined in four point paragraph four point eight what partnership tasking does and i'm not going to go into that a little detail obviously one of the things is that um, we rely on people to change their behavior which hopefully will happen and obviously a lot of the enforcement ops interactions are usually one-off offenses and they're dealt at the time of the offence and more complex issues are dealt with by our team of ward-based principal enforcement officers. They deal with issues in wards and I know some of you around the room have raised inquiries with the team which the principal enforcement officers would deal with. So uh, most of the work, everything is hub, so everything we do is, is intelligence-led, so officers aren't just randomly going out around the borough without knowing what, what they're looking for so everything's on an intelligence basis but obviously if they see something while they're going to be and they pass something on the road then they will deal with that as well so you can't account for every eventuality just some of the service highlights we deal with are a boards so the air board policy was implemented in 23 days and um, one of the things i have highlighted before and highlight again is that Obviously, we have TFL rules in the borough, and TFL have agreed now that our own enforcement officers can serve fixed penalty notices for issues on DA10, for example, which cause problems in terms of highway obstructions, on regulation of waste council, which you referred to with businesses we deal with as well. Obviously, one of our big roles is dealing with antisocial behaviour, which is problematic, and obviously. We have war principal officers which deal with those. They attend the war panel meetings on a regular basis and they attend other residence meetings as and when required. Obviously, one of the other things we have worked well, which we work with Hackney Housing and Pirate Radio Stations, which are a problem in particular areas of the borough. And obviously, people on there make a lot of money from advertising. And obviously, the other thing with that as well, they can affect people's televisions or phones or radio signals. So, not everyone has a mobile phone. If you've got a landline near the block of flats, you could be affected by the pirate radio station. So, and the week sees a lot of stuff on in connection with pirate radios as well, transmissions in particular, and cables and areas, etc. And um, I have gone into a lot of detail on paragraph 4.18 almost of the nighttime economy, because obviously a lot of our work is related around the nighttime economy, particularly shortage, not exclusively. There is nighttime economy as well in Dawson, which we deal with. Um, Hackney Central, this area around Bohemia Place, has a busy nighttime economy, and Hackney Week is an open clear. So we are dealing with all of those. And as I, in paragraph 4.19, I've referred to our community safety nighttime economy action plan, and that covers everything. We've had new CCTV installed in shortage. I think there might be one camera still to install. That's because of issues with TFL and getting permission. And 
we've done that. Obviously, we the late night levy funds enforcement officers, it funds police officers, and there's a lot of work that we do in that. So there is a commitment to use 70% of the net revenue from late night levy to contribute towards providing additional police patrols across the borough, but mostly focus on shortage. We've got so we've got CCTV with radio scheme, which we encourage. And there is a lot of joint work done by the police and the council on that. And last year, the police, we were at a case of £194,000 worth of late night levy income, which they have used to undertake additional patrols and they have extra staff and duty as finality, which would be Halloween, summer, Christmas, all various bank holidays to cover all that as well. And there is a sound town centre team in short, which has been here a couple of years, been really successful. And there is a specific nighttime economy action plan with objectives for all partners in that. Uh, it's detailed in the report of who wants to do that. One of the things I just wanted to highlight in the paragraph 4.26 on page 131 was that the intelligence hub now produces a weekly update, which we share with the police. And we have a weekly meeting every Thursday after the task meeting with a specific NT tasking meeting. We sort the deals with issues that have occurred in the last weekend. We know what the problem premises are, so we can target resources to those. We know, for example, how many noise complaints there would be about any specific premises. So there's a lot of work ongoing in that. And actually, that has been very successful in targeting businesses. And our environmental protection officers as well deal with commercial noise, attend that meeting. So. If there is a premises, we are spells. And obviously there will be problems with some premises, and but we know that, but in the main, things have improved. Um, one of the other big pieces of work we do, which can be controversial, are public space protection orders. So we've had one in, in Week Woodland in relation to ASB, which was very successful when it was implemented. That did expire and it was renewed in, April 2020, in last year. And obviously, it was extended to Hackney Marshes, Mill, Millfields, Melby Green, Dovney Fields, and other areas. That was approved in November 2022. And um, dog control order, public space and protection order in place since March 2021. That would expire in March 2024. We are actually seeking to do an extended consultation between July and October this year because that, we've looked at it and we've considered that that's the time of the year when public spaces are used more by people. There's more people out in parks, there's more people out with dogs. Whereas if we did the consultation in sort of November, December, January, we probably wouldn't get as good a response. So that hopefully will be approved by cabinet at the end of June. Um, the public space protection order for alcohol control was approved again by cabinet in October 2021 and again next year we will do a further consultation and getting that renewed by the end of October 2024 because each it has to be renewed every three years and there is a lot of work that has to go into getting the cabinet to approve the consultation to undertake the consultation and then go, taking it back to cabinet for approval so and obviously we have to take issues that are raised as a result of the consultation seriously because when we did the alcohol one, we did propose at the time having an alcohol ban in London Fields, but the feedback said, no, we don't want this, so we didn't proceed with that aspect of the PSPO. So we do take feedback from consultation into consideration. We just don't do we just don't ignore the consultation. So everyone's voice is felt. Um London Fields, we put additional resources into and the enforcement activity that was undertaken last year is shown in page four. Paragraph 4.35. Obviously, on this field, it's very challenging. It's very close to Broadway Market. So, there will always be issues and problems. And we have employed an additional enforcement team leader and enforcement officers this year again for the summer period. But as well as London Fields, they're covering other parks as well. And they're actually out on bicycles every day. So, it's a much easier way for them to get around to visit parks and green spaces. Um, the Dalston project is covered in page 4.38. And again, that was a three month project originally in December 2021. It's been extended. It's been extended again for this financial year because it has been quite successful. And obviously, again, one of the things we're doing is 
building the intelligence picture on that. Um, I just want to highlight paragraph 4.45 is that officers have done joint patrols to support services such as Turning Point, Swim, which, which is support where it matters, Street Link and Street Population Coordinator. So received that email for Swim, just it's a very good email showing actually it's something very positive and about how people have managed to turn their lives around, which I thought is something you would be interested in. And Councillor Billy Lovett, you asked about enforcement. The fixed penalty notices in Dawson in the last three years have shown bottom paragraph 4.46, and then 4.47 is the enforcement officer activity. And I, the rest, I think, is relatively straightforward. I think something you may be interested in is under paragraph 4.60 was the number of fixed penalty notices issued in the last three years. And you will see there's a huge variety of notices, fixed penalty notices served. And they having they did increase from 2021 to 22 to the previous year, and they have gone down again this year. But that's actually good news as well, because you would hope that people have changed their behavior. So if you've actually fixed penalty notices, one would hope you wouldn't get a second one. And one of the things we issue a lot of fixed penalty notices for sort of urination and waste of flight are littering in the nighttime economy and a lot of those are actually paid very very quickly because people obviously wake up and see the notices in their pocket the following morning and then they realize what's this one then pay so that is good but we still do a lot of work in relation to highway obstruction that's still one of our highest level of fixed penalty notices and it's a variety of fixed penalty notices we actually do for highway obstructions which are all there on page 140 so you can actually um one of the other things that i did mention earlier on is all the powers and the anti-social behavior crime and policing act 2014 so we use community protection warning notices community protection notices injunctions whatever needs to be done is we undertake and you will see on table five at the bottom of page 142 shows the three-year comparison what we've issued them warnings issued and community protection notices, injunctions, etc. And I do know for this year already, we've actually got four closure orders in the first two months of the year, which is quite good. So, and we, we they are undertaken in all over the borough. And I think there was one in your ward recently. So I think that's it for me, but I'm happy to take any questions from anyone. Thank you very much. Um, I would just remind members, actually, before we get into the discussion, that um, particularly on this sort of subject, comments are often very much informed by casework, um, but we can't get into any of the detail of casework. Um, Councillor Binny Lovick. Uh, thank you. Just quickly on a point of order, um, I, I feel like uh, the previous item uh, I thought we were maybe taking it in parts and we covered the food standards part, but we maybe didn't cover the health and safety and trading standards part, or was that all kind of covered off in that first section? I thought it was all covered off together, but partly because Jerry did his, um, was talking about all of it, all in that same section. So was it was there something that you wanted to raise about There was that? just one part in the... Um, well, sort of two parts in the trading standards bit. One, I was concerned about the uh, the goats and what was the outcome of the H uh, HARC's inspection of the of the goats that were reported. Um, and uh, more seriously, um, I was wondering if during uh, enforcement um, checks with fireworks stockists, um, any were being encouraged to sell fire, uh, quieter fireworks in line with the motion that the full council passed in January. Okay, let's take a step back then and answer those questions if that's all right. Everyone is encouraged, every business is encouraged to sell the less noisy fireworks. Right. And <laughs> the goats, while that is a specific case, well, there was nothing found untoward. Um, I had some points on, the, on this item as well, if that's okay. Go on then. Um, with the late night levy, it's good to see that there was joint patrols going on. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, if you know, as well as funding for the police, any of those partner services are getting cash from the late night levy. 
Um, and then with the stats that you have, the three-year comparisons, um, similar to an earlier point, I'm wondering if there's any sort of pre-pandemic comparisons that we, we could have, because obviously comparing with the last three years might um, not give us the full picture of how things are changing in the borough. We only normally give three years stats, but if I can get you statistics of 29-20 for fixed penalty notices if you want to. Yeah, I just think that generally that might show a better comparison because obviously they had we were able to have had a big dip during the, um, the COVID period and all stats during those COVID periods we have like a big asterisk next to them. And in terms of the late night levy, what we actually reports of say approved by licensing commission in relation to what the financial spend is for. So for example, this just enforcement officers, the late night levy manager and assistant is funded by the levy and this is an the council takes out of us. We also fund medics, acne medics, which we're funding as well. So there's a whole variety of, and there's a huge, huge amount of projects that are undertaken as well. So it's all detailed in licensing committee if you want to check that out further. I wouldn't necessarily include it in this report because it's not about licensing or. Councillor Young. I wanted to ask you a broad question about resourcing and enforcement. So obviously this, this plan is, you know, across quite a wide range of services. Um, I wondered whether enforcement, the, num the enforcement numbers shown here are kind of relatively low, not compared to other councils, but compared to the amount of, say, antisocial behaviour or, you know, noise. That one would expect to experience across a borough like Hackney. So I wondered whether your your view is that you your services are adequately resourced, and if they are not adequately resourced in order to tackle you know, all of the noise, all of the antisocial behaviour, all of the other things that we see and hear, um, how you prioritise those. So whether it's just those that are reported or those that are reported most loudly or frequently or whether you have a kind of way of um, identifying hotspots or what is your prioritization for enforcement so as i sort of briefly alluded to so in terms of say commercial noise and the nighttime economy so we have a weekly specific nighttime economy meeting so we will look at how many noise reports came in the previous week in relation to every premises in the borough and that's all shows up on the highlight. We also have access to police data, so we know how many instances there has been inside and outside a specific premises. So when we officers are doing patrols, or if a call comes in about noise, we know that I'm not going to name a specific premises wherever that would be picked up. Also in relation to ongoing casework, so we have a list for the officers who are usually if a case related that we know needs a pro needs a priority visit, then we will do that. And we look if cases can be prioritised for a number of reasons. It's not necessarily the number of reports that particular individuals made. There could be a very elderly, vulnerable person living there, and they probably is a higher priority than somebody who's able to, and as you know, an elderly person may not have the access to technology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or the capability or the know-how how to make reports where somebody who's akin with technology is in a much better position and their problem may not be as great and we will look at it that way um see yes we'd love to have more like the out of hours noise service seven days a week but that's a resourcing issue so we what the resources we can achieve with what we have we do i would say in terms of closure orders happy is one of the highest in london for getting them and the people people come to us asking how are you doing it? How are you dealing with that? And we're very good at dealing with ASB in particular, where there are problems. So a closure order would only be granted, for example, for premises where there was some serious issue to do with drug dealing, crime, whatever. So we did one recently, Councillor Rodner knows about us, is where this person had serious mental health problems and was causing nuisance to four other residents, and we dealt with that. There was a commercial business in Well Street, which we did, which was sort of a crime hotspot dealing with drug dealing etc so all of those things the combination of them, and these get challenged in court as well because obviously we've got to serve a closure notice first 
before we go to court to get the closure order. And then our officers get challenged in court all the time as to why you do this. It's not something we do. Everything we do, we do with evidence. And of course, as I said, the intelligence hub is there. They have every report that comes in about anything. And they're all looked at at a weekly task committee. So we know, say, Woodbury Down and the different states, how many intel reports we've had in the last week about particular states, roads, streets, whatever. So we know which ones to prioritise for the next week. So that's resource-wise, I would say it is, it's adequate, but we always need more. I'm not going to deny it. With what we have, everything is done in intelligence spaces, and that's why we're able to do what we do, what we can. Also, and as you were asking about sort of enforcement, we also have a three, we have an enforcement policy, which was approved by cabinet. And of course, we have need to comply with that. And obviously, that's a three stage process. So it's not just going in, prosecuting somebody for one off offence. We speak to people initially, then they get a notice. And then if they don't comply with that notice, we'll take them to court and they get prosecuted. But generally, people, it's a very small minority who will not comply. And we have this. Like, why would you go doing close, 100 closure orders some, a year when you don't need to? And obviously, I have to say, we work really good with the police in relation to those closure orders. The last few we've got, the police have supports us in court with evidence as well, and it's really, really good. And it's really good to know that at an operational level, I have to say, our dealings with the police are excellent. So it's, not, so it's just not us, it's a combination of purpose. It could be Hackney Housing, it could be Sanctuary Housing, Guinness Trust, Southern, whoever we deal with. And of course, one of the things as well which helps us, we've got a really good extensive CCTV system. So CCTV would pick, as you say, a picture paints a thousand words. So an image of CCTV is much better than me writing a 10-page witness statement. You know, that evidence is there. And of course, the CCTV work in conjunction with the police, they have the CCTV can radio the police directly. So we have lost, and that's their 24 7 here. And that's, that really is our main eyes and ears of everything. And one of the things we have been able to do is to get additional housing associations to pay for us to put in CCTV for them and monitor it. And that obviously helps us reduce ASB estates, which are non, say, non hack housing estates, which otherwise we wouldn't have that access to information. And if there's a critical incident or anything, it really, really helps us. That's really interesting. And, and so um, for some of the longer term and knottier problems, so I'm just going to fish out two from memory. So say you've got an area like Manor House where you've got an ongoing um, kind of antisocial behaviour problem linked to mental health, drink and drugs and so on, or some of them which are linked to planning. Um, how do, how do you ensure that that partnership working, you know, with the police, with Turning Point, with um, Swim, with you know the planning team and so on? How how do they? Can you tell us a little bit about how those operate so effectively? So that there's user. no wrong front door, I guess. So we have a street users outreach meeting every month, so people will be identified as needing help through that, and then one of the things. We did get to our previous cabinet and council so much has really been really helpful. We've got the street population coordinator. So their role is to deal with anyone who's got issues and they obviously deal directly with turning points when whoever needs to do that. So cases do are always picked up so that people and yes, there will be there are some really difficult cases to deal with. They're not necessarily our issue. It could be to do issues connection with TFL and getting answers of TFL isn't straightforward. So we, uh, we push and push and push to get things done. But a lot of our officers, I have to say, are very persistent in moving things forward. And so there was a case, for example, with a dangerous dog in Butterfield Park, for example, and we worked with the police to get that resolved, and that got resolved quite quickly. So if we know about something, we will deal with it. But again, as I say, people do need to report stuff to us. And I know you can say people, there's exhaustion from reporting, but I have to say, unless unless it's reported, it didn't happen. Um, on that subject, unless it's reported, it didn't happen. Um, it does seem to me that that we we are very reliant on those reports, and that quite often people can be reporting something, and when it's not resolved after two or three times, they get terribly disheartened and they stop reporting. Any thoughts about how we might continue to? 
to get them to keep reporting things even when they're not necessarily seeing any change immediately because obviously your officers are inclined to think the problem's gone away if the reports stop coming in. But if I use noise as a very good example, the system we have at the moment we have brought in last year, noise works. If you report once you get a reference number, if you go to make a second report, it does ask you, have you reported this before? You've got to put in the reference number and then that will get picked up by an officer. So it just won't go into an abyss. It'll be passed to an enforcement officer allocated to that case, so that, that should get picked up. And yes, a lot of cases get reported a lot of times, so that's good. But then as I said, not everyone has the know-how how to do the to report things. And we are reliant on people, say, reporting information to the police as well. And I've done it myself. I've tried to ring 101. It's a very slow process. And then people have very quick to criticise the council. But you try to report stuff to other partners or other organisations. It's not easy. And the council systems are actually, I think you will find a lot better. Good, thank you. Um, I can see that Councillor Susan Fajana Thomas has her hand up. She may want to comment on this, I don't know, and, and also Councillor Premier. So perhaps we'll take uh, Councillor Fajana Thomas first in case it is relevant to this. Oh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I just want to come in a resources issue, but before I go on to that, can I just remind Cos about ASB? Like you said, it's good for for us to encourage residents to report things to us, but ultimately streets be responsibility sit with the police. So we work closely with the police to make sure that acting streets are safer, but it is uh, it, it is the police that is responsible for that. In terms of these are no councillor, Young was asking whether there is adequate resources. I thank Jerry's team for what they are doing with the little we have. But having said that, we know that in the last 10 years, the council have lost half of our funding from the, 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 the Holy government. And as a result of that, well, we all see presentation from our cabinet member for finance, how we need to uh but uh, uh to balance the book so uh, the community safety and business services are not isolated so year on year on there are savings from the from the uh, uh, services that is strain the capacity but having said that is not that the risk the the council has got that resources and they're not uh, putting it forward for this day general position of of the resources we have in, in in hackney just want to say that to colleagues that it's not because uh, we're struggling because of the situation the Tory government have put local authority in the last 10 years so i just want to make that clear but as as cabinet lead i try as much as possible in the report jerry mentioned the dustin project as well as london field working with jerry and our lead richard making sure that when we need to put a bid to central funding like the funding for london field and the dustin project being done around that thanks jay just want to make that leaks thank you very much um, Councillor Primo. Thanks very much, Chair, and, and thanks, Jerry. And um, Councillor Vajana Thomas, here, I hear what you're saying about the, the um, brutal cuts by the government. Um, but going back to the um, resourcing um, issue, which um, Councillor Young brought up, Jerry, I was just wondering um, around the fact that we've sadly got um, you know, an, an incredible problem and an and, um, ongoing problem with uh, violence against women and girls that's very prevalent, has been um, very highlighted and, and that everybody's working hard on, on trying to support. Is this an area that you, you feel is adequately resourced or, some, or something that needs extra resources? And the other question was around um, night noise and uh, kind of the noise abatement, but also linking with, with the environment about resourcing, because I know there are 
um, restrictions on the time that that is available to people and there's a lot of online things but without bringing casework into it um i know there are sort of examples of for example businesses um and um say garages working out of hours and um, you know the, with the attendant noise and littering and antisocial behavior too uh that might be more people going to more than one agency um i just was wondering um how you felt resourcing was for that those kind of areas as well thanks very much and in terms of violence against women and girls, particularly in the nighttime economy, we have a huge amount of resource put into that through our Hackney Nights programme, which is supported by Council for Joanna Thomas, which relates to misogyny, assaults, um, even the last bank holiday weekend, we put in a welfare unit and a trial basis, which we got a lot of really good positive feedback from. So we have put a lot of money that also with Council for Joanna Thomas's support we undertook in you know, order to follow on for the 16 days of violence against women and girls as sort of any environmental audit, environmental visual audit. And we're actually at the moment, we have a bit put in for additional, we've identified four areas which need long term CCTV monitoring. We have got temporary CCTV in bid to get permanent funding for that. So there is a lot of work ongoing. Obviously, that service doesn't sit here with my service, but we do a huge amount of work with to approve issues associated with violence against women and girls. In terms of garages working and things like that, if things that, if you're aware of any specific issues, email member services, and if they relate to either, if it's a composite reply, we'll go to another service, i.e. planning of street scene, and we will deal with them. But if we are aware of garages working late at night and littering, we will address those and deal with them. Um, the other thing I did want to say was we are putting additional out of hours noise resources into commercial noise of weekends as well on Friday and Saturday night, and that will be happening from July. So, the, so we so that will happen this month as well, at the end of this month. So we'll be able to target businesses better as well. Thank you, um, Councillor Joseph. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so I've got I've got two points I'd like to make, please. And um, the first one is on 4.31, which is essentially on um, dog fouling. Um, it's um, a big concern of mine, maybe because I've got a very small child, so I do spend a lot of time in the parks. Um, but it does seem to be um, a bit of an issue at the moment. So there's not a week goes by that my child isn't treading in poo or getting poo on him somehow. Um, and I have actually spoken to people when I've seen them allow their dog to do this and walk away, some varying levels of success. Um, I have reported it, but it is obviously a difficult one because once the person's walked off, how you track them down, it's, uh, I appreciate it, it's a difficult thing, but I'm just wondering, like from the way I see it, if people are scared of being fined, then they generally don't do something. And I think, you know, people don't overstay on their parking in the borough because they're pretty confident they'll get a ticket. Um, I'm just not sure how we're able to enforce it. I mean, whether you've got the capacity for enforcing around that, but it is kind of um, a measure of the public realm and a, quite a health issue really for young children. So um, it would be good to get data to ascertain whether or not there's been much enforcement around that and what we might be able to do collectively to support it. Um, that's a big concern um, for me. And the other one I just wanted to briefly touch on, if I may, is um, the enforcement around payday lending, money shops. Um, I think you mentioned cash converters is, is the one that we've got. And I appreciate that um, they've got less of a physical presence now. I think it's more online and maybe door-to-door -door lending. And I just wondered if we got any powers over enforcement um, with the bigger on online companies that could be targeting our residents or um, sort of loan shop, basically door to door. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Councillor. Um, what we can do, if we know there's a particular hotspot and there's a dog farm, we can actually get additional signage put up there saying the PSPO is in place and patrols undertaken. So if we catch people, we will find them. We've had success in doing so. and. There was a case, Councillor Young knows about this, where 
Um, it was on an estate where a member of the public actually assaulted our enforcement officers while they were dealing with the dog fouling. He get issued with fixed penalty notices. He was prosecuted in court last week. So we will take enforcement action where we need to. But again, as I would say, if you could report this on on the portal, it would really help because then I can get officers to do. If we go to weekly tasking, if it shows up, there's an increase, then officer patrols will be undertaken. We are. And, it, and then we will, and we can we can do patrols whenever they need a day, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday evening we have people on duty, so we can cover whatever needs to be done. So that shouldn't be an issue. In relation to payday lenders, that's something trading standards would deal with. And if the on if the pens were allocated, if it's within the borough, yes, we will deal with it. But if it's online, if we're uh, trading standards, would need to refer that to the local authority within the area the pay their lender sits. But if you've any specific concerns, can I ask you to email trading standards directly and they will respond to that. Because our officers are, are and the one thing I'd say is well all of our trading officers are now are all now actually they're doing qualifications and in financial investigations. So they're well versed in that and how to deal with that type of stuff. Thank you very much. Um, I think there is a page actually um, on page 139. It shows that uh, dog control failing to remove dog feces. We had only two um, uh, FPNSs no issued. And so I don't know. I mean, it's really difficult, isn't it, to catch these people? But would, are, are you saying that for things like dog fouling and perhaps fly tipping is another one which comes into this kind of category that um, if you have regular reports of, of particular places you can adjust your resources accordingly. Good and presumably that's a message that you'd like to go to the public not just to councillors. <laughs> um, any more questions? Uh, Councillor Samatar. Thank you. Um, I can't believe I'm asking a math question, but we'll roll with it. There it is. Um, on um, 4.21, page 128, and it says here there is a committed, um, when we're talking about the nighttime levy, that 70% of the net revenue would be used towards providing additional police, which is great. And then it lists in bullet points some of the other things that it will be used for. Is that the rest of the 30% all of it? Or is that like breaking down into different kind of um, things? I just wanted to have a vision of that. And the other thing was um, here on 4.21 slash 4.22, 4.23, etc. as you go down, there's a lot of um, updates on the amazing work that's been done in Shoreditch. And um, there's also Dawson mentioned somewhere as well. And I think there was a bullet point on Hackney Central, but there's only like a small section that says enforcement and, you know, patrols across the borough. But exactly where else has been covered is there any way of finding out a bit more in terms of like the greater detail when it comes to nighttime economy because of course shortage is very busy and there's so much going on but like what's been done in different parts as well in relation to your first question um, i answered this through council Benny Lobach earlier is this how the finances are spent is reported to licensing commission but as you say the we may not spend all the money. So if we don't spend all the money, we carry it over to the next year. So we keep money in reserve. So for example, we didn't have enough money last to give the Hackney Medics a contract, but because we got a lot of money income in, we put that in reserves and we've been able to give the Medics a year's contract. So things like that. And say the welfare area, we've been able to fund as well. We wouldn't have had in the previous. So doing the trials of welfare, all these things cost money. We have. Another thing we do is we have a mobile messaging vehicle and that puts out messages about violence against women and girls, it puts out messages about thefts. There's a video from the police which shows up on us. It's, it's, a big, it's a big, big advertising thing. In relation to patrols, we do patrols all over and I have said the Dawson team will cover sort of areas up and down the F10 and to some particular area in Shackleville and we're quite happy for them to look at that but they are principally based in Dawson. But 
all areas where ASB and whatever is reported, patrols are undertaken. And again, that comes up again at a weekly tasking meeting, so we know where the officers will be concentrating in the last week. And the other thing is our Hackney Housing Funds want to make a contribution towards enforcement. So they attend the tasking meeting and they have their own lists of estates and areas that need to be visited every week. And they put in bids as well saying, we need this, we need this to be visited. And the patrols are taken at all hours of the day and night and officers will go up stairwells and blocks of flats to see if people are there drug dealing or smoking or whatever undertaking antisocial behavior and decreases so we have a variety of and again something like that if we know that's happening on a regular basis that's something that we could possibly apply for a closure order again but again to get a closure order as i said you need evidence we can't take any action without evidence um, just a, one very last quick one, Chair. Um, and this again, um, maybe Councillor for Janet Thomas can come in as well. On the, um, the town centre team that's uh, mainly operating in Shoreditch, and I know I've seen a lot of advertisement on social media and like different um, places as well, but how much um, information is being given in terms of collaboration with local businesses to make sure, like especially in areas where um, um, women might be at risk during nights, etc. There is enough information and coverage of safety, kind of. And also, is there a number or like a ways of easily accessing? I'm thinking future like apps and stuff here, like ways of people to know that this team is actually out there rather than posters and like social media. So, what we provide for businesses is we we provide wave training for businesses, which covers all this type of. It covers every aspect of that building safety, women's safety, and such. Another campaign we have is, is like Ask for Angela. So if you're going into a business, say, i use a bar as an example, and a woman mentions this, a uh, member of staff Ask for Angela, that's a sign she needs help without actually anyone knowing. Because obviously one of the things with mobile phones and that, that can be coercive control and all that type of thing, so it's not always the answer. And also the violence against women and girls teams have a lot of other work they undertake, which I'm sure Councillor Janet Thomas can expand on, should you need it. Shall we go to Councillor Fajana Thomas for the last word on this then? Thank you. Oh, thanks, Chair. Without getting this into licensing or happening night meeting, just to say to colleague, the late night levy is was established under the reform and Social Responsibility Act 2011, and the, the levy in the legislation is stated. So there is to what some of the things we can do with the, with the levy. In the levy actually stated that 70% of it to be used uh, around policing. So that is why that sort of amount is not us in Hackney, the percentage of what what goes to the police within the levy if that is from the legislation and in terms of violence against women and girls and i will say this with humility chair even uh national nice what we are doing in acne just a month ago as you know the public harassment bill is going through parliament at the moment that is sponsored by uh, craig clark I was invited because of the level of our war and violence against uh, women and girls to speak at the Westminster policies on initiative Hackney has introduced in tackling against women and girls. Hackney has the highest number of detention and conviction rate around violence against women and girls, not just London, but nationally. That is the that is the work we are doing with the police. Uh, violence against women is within my portfolio, but it's not within uh, Jerry's portfolio. Is is sit with uh, 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 family and children services, and we've got the uh, domestic uh, abuse and intervention service. That is a multi agency uh, service in the council that uh, supports that's where violence against women and girls sit and supports uh, 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 this and the campaign but the 
late night levy is really we just started the campaign that is going to involve Hamlet, Hackney and City of London around shoddies because most of the violence against women and girls uh, there is uh, or a sort of uh, or happens at late night so because of that and ensure they're putting uh, or resources together to uh, or for that campaign sorry did i miss anything uh ifra in what you said about or uh, in terms of night late night levy again people pay levy are licensed premises that serve alcohol after midnight so it's not all area it's not all licensing premises that sell alcohol that pay late night levy is only if you sell alcohol after uh, midnight so the concentration of those uh, premises are around do mostly short dish around dusting and in or uh, hackney uh, sent and hackney downs that's why resources are focusing in those areas thanks chair thank you councillor fajana thomas it's a difficult subject but quite good to have a bit of positive news to end on with it thank you um good okay i think uh we're slightly over time so i think we should move on quickly to conclude the meeting if we can um we just need to have a very quick look at the draft work program chair just of mine there's obviously a recommendation for Gary's item I know it's just for noting but just to... oh sorry what's the yeah. recommendation uh, it's, on, it's on the on your chair three for the bottom of page three uh... I, think oh, just, I think it's just a note the report but I just, the report. just for completion okay. okay we note the report noted noted thank you thank you very thank much thank you um yes the draft work program um I think we've already discussed some elements of it really uh, we talked about how the public realm update is going to shift into september and also how the we're hoping that the first strategic review report can be discussed then as well um, and the peer review that we discussed later on will, will probably slip way down into december or march um, but really this is just a note um so we can note that noted thank you um i don't have any other business i consider to be urgent um so unless anybody else has got anything i'll just remind everybody the next meeting is on the 12th of september um but i look forward to seeing you before then <laughs> thank you thank you so much